Hello and welcome to our Sunday gathering here at Castle Hill Baptist Church Online. My name's Kevin and it's my pleasure to be leading our service this morning as we gather to worship together wherever we are. We're going to start our service by hearing some words from scripture. I'm going to read from Psalm 95 before we sing together in response. Psalm 95 says this. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. In his hands are the depths of the earth and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his, for he made it and his hands formed the dry land. Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. Loving God, as we gather before you this day, as we come together from many different places and spaces, Lord, by your spirit, would you fill us? Would you unite us? Would you help us to know that you are with us? And would you lead our service as we sing praise to you? Starting today with crown you with many crowns. Crown him with many crowns. So let's pray together. Lord, we've come before you in song, declaring you the Lamb of God, the Lord of life, the Lord of peace, the Lord of love. And we praise you, Lord, that everything in creation is yours. That right down in the depths of the oceans, up to the mountain peaks and beyond into the infinite universe, 
It all is created by you and it is all yours. And yet you are mindful of us. That you should care for us is just amazing. And so this day, Lord, we want to give you praise and thanks that you are the rock of our salvation, that you are the Lord who is king above all other kings, that you are the one who leads our flock, that we are under your care and that we can trust in you utterly. And so whatever has been going on for us this week, whatever is laid on our hearts, we thank you that in this place, we can bring it to you and yet we can still worship you with all that we are. So loving Father, please guide us as we gather in this day. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, last week we introduced a new memory verse and today, Kathy's going to help us think a little bit about what that can mean for us. Hello, everyone. I wonder, can you remember which book in the Bible the memory verse Kevin gave to us last week came from? Well done if you said 1 Peter. We know that Peter was a disciple of Jesus. But before he followed Jesus, what was his job? Here are some clues for you. We read in the Gospels that he was a fisherman, and I think that is helpful when it comes to understanding and remembering our memory verse. There were a few times when Peter had to realise his own limitations and recognise the sovereignty or rule of God, or as he puts it, humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. When he was in his fishing boat in a storm with Jesus, Peter experienced God's authority, his sovereignty. The storm was beyond human control, and although Peter was an expert fisherman, in the face of such a storm, he had to humble himself and accept that God was in control. Similarly, when he tried to reach Jesus by jumping into the sea, it was Jesus who stretched out his hand and saved him. Peter had personally experienced the way God can lift us up with his mighty hand. So he can say these words, Humble yourselves therefore under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Let's say those words together. Humble yourselves therefore under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. And in verse 7 we are told, Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. The word cast is exactly the same word that you would use to cast a net when fishing. Peter remembered how Jesus had commanded him to cast his net into the deep. He seems to be telling us that not only must we recognise our own limitations and God's power, but we must also throw on to him our worries and cares. We are to cast into the water those things that weigh us down and leave us feeling exhausted. What are the things that cause us to be anxious? Maybe worries about the future, whether we will do well at school or in our job. Perhaps we don't have a job and we're worried about that. Maybe worries about our health or things to do with friendships and family. Or maybe worries about what other people think of us. Or in difficult times like this, maybe worry about security and money. What happens when we cast these worries onto God? Well, thinking of that water that Peter cast his net into, we might see it a bit like this. Imagine that the salt on this spoon represents those anxieties, maybe worries about money or health. Can you imagine having to swallow this quantity of salt? It would be unbearable, a bit like trying to cope with some of our problems alone. But what happens when I cast them into this water? 
they disappeared? Well, not exactly. They're still there. But the power of God is there to help that anxiety become less. The saltiness is less intense. Its strength to overwhelm has gone as we allow God to take control. When we recognise our own limitations and have a right view of ourselves, then God's power available to us to help us with those anxieties becomes evident. The sea becomes calm and we can see Jesus shouldering our cares. He is there with us. Not that our anxieties disappear, but with his support, they do not overwhelm us. Let us then say together, humble yourselves therefore under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. 1 Peter 5, 6-7 Well, thanks to Kathy for that really helpful unpacking of our memory verse, 1 Peter 5 verses 6 and 7. And also thank you to all of you who uh, were able to gather with me on Facebook Live on uh, Friday as we spent the day praying for our nation. I know others of you who weren't able to do that were still playing throughout the day. Uh, And so I just uh, thank you uh, for your commitment to trusting in the Lord and putting these things before him. We know he is faithful, and we know that he has heard our prayers. Let's keep praying uh, for our nation to to come to know the Lord, and also for this virus to come to an end. Now, one of the ways that you can do that, and I know some of you will be delighted by this news, is that we're able uh, from Thursday this week uh, to be able to open our building for an hour Uh, for private prayer and then again on the following Sunday. So this is a new thing for us. We've worked really hard to uh, make sure that we're abiding by all the uh, rules and regulations that are out there. And trust me, it's a really complicated thing. And I'm so grateful to to Nick and to Liz for their help in working this through. Uh, There's more information in uh, CHBC News, including the timings when it's open, which, which will alter depending on what else is going on during the week. Uh, But there's no need to register. Uh, We're not expecting a a huge influx of people. uh, And so you can just drop in and stay for however long uh, you want to during that time. Uh, The only thing I need to emphasize is is that it's not going to be one of those things where you you can wander around the building and you can look at all the new work, which is fantastic, that has been done. We will work to make that available as soon as we can. But that's not what this is about. This is about private prayer, so so sadly no socialising either. Just coming and spending time in the space where we'll we'll have some music uh, playing quietly in the background. We'll have some visuals and Bible verses uh, to help you if that's what you would like. Uh, But otherwise, it's it's your time with the Lord. And it's just a space which we feel uh, some people would like to use uh, intentionally to help them in their prayer life. So do keep an eye on uh, the CHBC News for more information on that. Uh, And if you're not getting that and you're interested in in, uh, finding out more, uh, then please do go to our Connect page uh, where you can sign up for that newsletter. Now today uh, is also uh, an international day of prayer for the persecuted church. And this year, Open Doors is partnering with CSW, uh, Release International and the Evangelical Alliance to hold an evening of prayer and worship this evening, that Sunday. Uh, We'll also uh, join in prayer with the persecuted church uh, in a little while. But first, we're going to sing again uh, the new song which we introduced last week, proclaiming the amazing grace that all who believe receive through Christ our living hope. Jesus 
I'm sure it's the desire of all of our hearts to see each person we know come into a living relationship with Jesus. And as a fellowship, one of the ways we can help them on their journey is by offering events which allow Christians and non-Christians to easily mix together 
uh, to build relationships and normally to introduce them to our church building and demystify this idea of what church is, assuming that's even occurred to them at all. Now, of course, we can't do some of this this year, but Kathy and her team have been exploring other ways we might contribute to, to reaching out in a gentle way. And if you're averse to Christmas paraphernalia this early in the year, uh, you may want to prepare yourself for Jan's accessory. Hi, Jan. Hi. Oh, I can see you're in festive mood. Have of you, course. <laughs> have you done all your preparations for Christmas already? Amazing. No, not really. I, mind you, I have got my Christmas crackers, but that's because I forgot to put them out last year. Oh, and well so, done. So we'll tick that off, and then I've got my shortbread because um, somebody stayed before this present lockdown overnight, and they gave me a present of shortbread. So we'll tick that off the list, and I've sorted out the Christmas cake. But you know, Christmas pudding. Last year we made one at church. So what's going to happen now? I have to go and buy one from some supermarket. No, no, homemade is always better. I've got some good news for you. Despite COVID, we're still going to have a community pudding making experience. Ooh, ooh, this exciting. time, yes, you've guessed, we're going to make puddings on Zoom. Zoom? What would we do without it? Well, first thing people will have to do is to register on the church website. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to provide uh, the ingredients and the pudding basin via a click and collect service from Gateway, the cafe next door to church. That'd be great. So uh, when can I register? And when will I have to collect it? Right, well, registration is going to start tomorrow, Monday, Ooh. and the collection will be the day before the event, which will right. be Saturday the 28th of November. So what will we do then on Zoom? On the, on, presumably on the Sunday? Yes, so the idea is that you will get everything together that we uh, have put in your uh, takeaway, your click and collect parcel. You'll need a pudding uh, mixing bowl and a spoon. And then when you've got yourself organised and ready, you need to log on to uh, the Zoom uh, registration details that yeah. we will send you. Okay. And you'll be able to make your pudding along with a lot of other people. Oh, so um, it sounds very exciting. Are we going to advertise it? Should I be telling all my friends now? Well, there is going to be some advertising. Obviously, we're going to go through things like Facebook and we'll be emailing oh. previous contacts mm -hmm. and uh, following up on Chase the Light as well, the people who yep. took part in that. Um, and there will be some posters and flyers as well. Okay. Okay, and what will happen on the day then? We'll do the Zoom and um, what will happen to, say I have my grandchildren here, what are they going to be doing? Because right, well, I having have. grandchildren along may be difficult because we're still in lockdown. Oh, of but, course. Um, we are going to provide craft activities and a family quiz. So oh, there will be anyone, entertainment for lots of people. Yes. Oh, good. Good. Well, it'd be a good way to spend a Sunday afternoon. In particular, people need something now. Uh, they think, oh, we're stuck in lockdown. Um, so it's something to look forward to before the end of lockdown. Absolutely. And it would be great if people could be praying about that now yes. and mm -hmm. thinking about who they could invite uh, to register for the making of the puddings. Oh, that that's great. And. Um, I suppose we're going to be um, paying, how much will we pay? Well, we're going to suggest a donation of six pounds. Right. The ingredients in the pudding basin cost uh, over five pounds. Right. But we do want to make donations to our Christmas charities. Um, Which we're going is to Zoe's Place. That's, That's Zoe's Place. Right. Yeah, we're going to support Zoe's Place and the hospital in Chad, uh, the St. Helm Hospital in Chad. Okay. It sounds great to me and can't wait to get myself um, signed up on Monday. That's great and spread the word. Yes. Thank you.
Oh, I love it. What a great idea. Thanks to Jan and Kathy and their team. So do sign up from tomorrow. Do tell friends and family, especially those who haven't been connected with our church before. And if you're someone who would struggle to collect the bags because of mobility or health issues, uh, then please don't let that stop you. Uh, we'll help you out, those few who can't get to us in person. So still sign up and just get in touch with Kathy so that we can uh, arrange that for you. Now, we're going to focus on something quite different and more serious and possibly not suitable for the younger in our congregation. And I'm going to start this part of our time by reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 26. If one part of our body suffers, every part suffers with it. And if one part is honoured, then every part rejoices with it. Did you know a staggering 260 million Christians live in the top 50 countries where they face high or extreme levels of persecution for their faith? In the previous year, it was 245 million, so we're up 15 in a further 23 countries outside this top 50, an estimated 50 million more Christians are facing high levels of persecution, including places like Mexico, Chad and the Democratic Republic of Congo. Last year, 2,983 of our brothers and sisters were killed for believing in Jesus Christ, our living hope. And whilst this is mercifully down from previous years, Attacks on church buildings is up 500%. In many countries, persecution is multidimensional. For instance, gender and ethnicity can play a role together. Digital technology, particularly in China and India, is being used to identify and target Christians. And political instability makes space for extremist groups to threaten the church, particularly in the Middle East. But there is also good news, friends. For the first time in decades, Christians in Sudan are no longer ruled by the dictator, President Omar al-Bashir, bringing hope that great freedoms may become a reality in the future. In Kenya, the hostile Mandarir County, uh, local Muslims unusually last year warned some Christian workers of the impending extremist attack. This warning almost certainly saved many lives. And in Iraq, as Islamic State is being driven out from the Nineveh plain, Christians have begun to return to their homes and start to rebuild their lives. Above all, the World Watch List shows that the church is very much active and alive and growing, but also that the persecution of Christians is more severe than ever and rising. But as Open Door says, this only happens where the church is actively sharing the gospel and living it out. So today, we intentionally take time to pray for our brothers and sisters around the world who are being persecuted for following Jesus, no matter the cost. And we're going to do this by watching two short interviews, kindly made available to us by Open Doors UK and Release International. And then Claire and then Liz are going to lead us in prayer for each of those situations. So let's watch our first interview together. ਸੋਸ ਮੈਨੂੰ ਇਹ ਲੱਗ ਕੇ ਮੈਂ ਹੁਣ ਜੋ ਮੇਰੇ ਖੁਦਾ ਨੇ ਭੇਜਿਆ ਜ਼ਿੰਦਗੀ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਹੈ ਨਾ ਮੇਰੀ ਉਹ ਕੋਈ ਨਹੀਂ ਹੈਗੀ ਮੇਰੀ ਮੈਂ ਤੇ ਹੁਣ ਇਹ ਵਾਕ ਕਦੀ ਮੈਂ ਮਾਸਾ ਦੇ ਕਰੀ ਤੋਲਾ ਹੁਣ ਵੀ ਮੈਨੂੰ ਇੱਕ ਹਫਤਾ ਹੋ ਗਿਆ ਅੱਜ ਮੇਰੀ ਥੋੜੀ ਤਬੀਅਤ ਸਹੀ ਹੈ ਉਹ ਜਿਆਦਾ ਨਾ In Pakistan, the sentence of blasphemy against Islam and its prophet can be life imprisonment or death. Once someone has been accused before their case has even gone to trial, they and their families can come under attack. So what is Zafar's story? Can you tell us his story? Yes, he told me that he, uh, he was uh, working as a, as a journalist. He was writing stories on behalf of Christians and against uh, this uh, persecution things. And uh, then somebody uh, used 
his mobile and send a, a nasty text to someone and uh, that text was uh, uh, against the prophet and uh, this was a blasphemy uh, case against him and insulting Muhammad anybody can kill him this mob beat a university student to death in Pakistan says it's the two percent Christian population that most needs protecting फिर मैं उन्हें बाद से कोई थोड़ा बहुत फ्रूट ले आ जानी है तो करना मैं और की है बस मेरे जिन्हें जो भी है मैं उन्हें की काम नहीं है तो जानी मैं ये मैं कभी मैं नहीं भी ना जानती तो फिर वो आंधे ने नहीं तो कुछ भी ना पाने ले आ का तो आ जाए है कार में लोग तो वो मैं दिल्ली तो आ कार नहीं है और जो मैं चर्च जानी हूँ वो मेरे दिल के बच्च जी गल् होंदिया ने ना वो मैं लाजमी मतलब एक कलाम के बच्चे पढ़नी हूँ I asked him, so how do you spend your time? Because you are all alone here, and uh, in one room you get bored, and uh, uh, and what do you do? And he said, I have been in this room for seven years, and only once in twenty-four hours they give us a, a little walk before the cell. So now he is reading a Bible, he is praying. And this is his time uh, there. He's spending. And I uh, encourage to Zafar Bhatti, brother, you are doing this good, and uh, uh, you know every day you read the Bible. So be encouraged because the Lord Jesus is with you. And uh, when he saw us while we were visiting him, and he said, "I am really encouraged uh, as you have visited me." I think uh, every prisoner should be visited because uh, uh, they are feeling loneliness and they are living uh, a life out of society so uh, they must be encouraged Let us pray Heavenly Father we lift our eyes to you, Lord, in prayer for the country of Pakistan. We pray for the Christians living there who face a life of persecution. Lord, we pray that a culture and legal system based on fear and violence is replaced by one of compassion and tolerance. We pray for the laws to be changed so that Christians living in Pakistan are free to worship, speak and affirm your name, Jesus. Lord, open doors so that the gospel can spread throughout the country. And Father, be with the peacekeepers that want to build bridges between the communities. Heavenly Father, we pray particularly for Zafar Bahati and his family. For Zafar, we pray that he knows your peace and love in the darkness of his prison cell. We pray that he is released from prison and finds a place of sanctuary. We pray for his wife as she seeks to visit him. Open doors of opportunities so that her visits are easy and free from fear or hardship. Lord, we pray for the works of release partner. Thank you, Lord, for them and their compassion, commitment and bravery in supporting the persecution church in Pakistan. Continue to go before them and with them as they continue their work. Lord, thank you for every Christian who lives in Pakistan. Thank you that your word breathes life into each one of them. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> This is my Esther. In the next talk, my daga chicken made a brief burn of it. In a shakara issue. Abunda Gaskia Yakamata, I eat a Hawaiian Yakamata. Jamaj Mutani chicken dunya. When the Sunan Allah Alberca chased Babu. Suma Suis Temaka Allah Sutema Kama Matan the Suka Kasaka. Sobo the Kuma says Kadas Tuna Baya, the Shari Hawaiians.
Esther painted her self-portrait during a trauma care program for survivors of sexual violence. As a teenager, she was kidnapped by Boko Haram extremists and forcibly married. Heavily pregnant, she managed to escape. She gave birth to little Rebecca. Sadly to her community, Esther is a Boko Haram woman. And they call Rebecca Baby Boko. The trauma care helps Esther and other women like her to come to terms with what happened to them. Before I came for this program, if you called my daughter Boko Haram baby, I would fight. Now even if they call her that, I don't feel pain anymore because I know that's not who my baby is. Your support is helping women like Esther on their journey of healing. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, our hearts break when we listen to Esther's story of kidnap, pain and rejection. Thank you that your heart breaks too, and you have reached out to her in love and compassion. Thank you for the trauma counselling she has received, and the wonderful transformation it has made to her life. Father God, we pray for more healing and wholeness for Esther. May she grow strong in you, and in her confidence in who she is. We pray too for her family and her village. Lord, would you change their hearts so that they would accept and love both Esther and little Rebecca. Please bring restoration to the whole of this community. Father, we thank you for the Open Doors Partners who are running these trauma support programmes in Nigeria. Please give them your compassion and understanding and the strength to continue in their challenging work. Please help them to reach more women who have suffered violence and abuse. May their message of hope reach each woman in need. Thank you for the encouragement Esther gives to other women on the programme. We pray that each of them will discover God's healing love for themselves. May they be able to testify like Esther, I know God loves me. Lord, we pray for your ongoing blessing in this land. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So tonight at half past seven, there's a time of worship and prayer being hosted by Open Doors Online in support of the persecuted church. The, the link's on the screen. And if you'd like to join with our international friends, then I'm sure you'd be very welcome to worship with them as we continue to pray for them this day for us and this service we're going to continue our time by studying God's word and opening up to John's gospel and today we continue the story of the woman at the well so do grab your bible as we pick up the story in chapter four this week being read by Anna and George hi our bible reading for today is John chapter 4 verses 27 to 42 just then, his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman. But no one asked, what do you want? Or, why are you talking with her? Then, leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, come, see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Christ? They came out of the town and made their way towards him. Meanwhile, his disciple urged him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. Then his disciples said to each other, Could someone have brought him food? My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Do you not say, 
four months more and then the harvest. I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Even now, the reaper draws his wages. Even now, he, the, he harvests the crop for eternal life, so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Thus, the saying, one sows and another reaps, is true. I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work, and you have reaped the benefits of their labor. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did, so when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, We no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this man really is the savior of the world. Well, I wonder if you can remember the last time you were totally consumed by an activity. Perhaps you were gardening, or reading a book, or working on a project, only to look up and think, Gosh, is that the time already? You know, when we find something that interests us, it can override a number of our senses, including our need for food or concern for time. Now, I used to read uh, some books about good time management, and one of the things they always warned against was that desire to do the enjoyable over the necessary. You know, that, that pile of mail that needs sorting can always seem to take forever to get through. But there never seems to be enough time to spend being all consumed by a great big band recording. Now our concept of the thing that's important can sometimes be called food for the soul. And some therapists have even found that helping people rediscover meals from happier times or activities that hold fond memories can help people in their recovery from depression as the act itself nourishes us deep within. Finding that thing which energises us is so important. And this is what we see happening for Jesus. No, not that he's depressed or in need of restoration, but that he's doing the one thing that energises him so much that he would describe it as food. And what is that food? Well, verse 34 tells us. My food, says Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Now in that moment, Jesus tells his followers that he's not hungry because he has food to eat that they know nothing about. This food is satisfying a spiritual hunger as he sees this Samaritan woman leave her water jar behind, designed to hold that old stale water of the old covenant, and go to tell the people of the town about the new living water that's just been revealed to her by Jesus. This is like one of those moments for each of us when we've done a good day's work, whatever work looks like to you, and we feel satisfied that what we've done has achieved something, and so we can relax knowing that as a fact. You see, no matter how muddled this woman is about who Jesus may be, she has certainly moved on in her understanding and does the one thing all followers of Jesus are asked to do. Tell other people about him. Now, albeit with a bit of exaggeration, she says, Come, see a man who told me everything I ever did. This is not the Christ, is it? A woman almost certainly rejected by her town or most of her town for her chosen life history suddenly finds themselves listening to this scorned woman. There's something different about her, they say. Look, she's got a a glint in her eye. What is it she's saying? The Messiah? In the place where the disciples of Jesus had only been concerned about their stomachs, This woman returns evangelising of the one who will save people 
from hell and give them everlasting life. She seeks to satisfy their souls by saying, come and see. And this is what I love about her reported words. She doesn't say she has found him. She says, come and see this man Jesus. Could he be the Messiah we've been searching for? The power of asking questions and letting others investigate is really important. For none of us are slot machines. If we are going to form a a solid relationship with any truth, we have to own it for ourselves. And that means we, we, we might not have the same questions as the next person. But if we can help to direct their inquiry, uh, then bring someone directly to the source, then bringing someone directly to the source is by far the best way. It's why it's so important that we are soaked in scripture. Not being filled with pseudo-Christianity passed on from our friends or family, but owning it for ourselves. Having a relationship with Jesus directly knowing his words, having experienced his actions, the power of his spirit in our lives, having heard the testimony of others for ourselves. For there is no greater power than allowing God's word to be brought alive in another person through the power of the Holy Spirit moving in a true seeker. For as the Apostle Paul told the listeners in Athens, starting from scratch, God, he he made the entire human race and made the earth hospitable with plenty of time and space for living so we could seek after God and not just grope around in the dark, but actually find him. He doesn't play hide and seek with us. He's not remote. He's near. Jesus does not hide from anyone and is forthcoming to those who seek him. He is waiting at the door and knocking. We just need to encourage people to be willing to let him in and to spend time with him. This was the excitement within the lady with no name. She forgot the physical water and went to share the spiritual water with all she could find. Now, while she's doing this, Jesus helps his disciples understand there is something greater going on. And that they need to lift their eyes up to see. So as Jesus unpacks this idea using the metaphor of food and harvest, you have to imagine him seeing in his mind's eye, and then literally the people coming from the town in the distance to see him as the gospel message goes forth. For from a harvest is found the ingredients to make the food. And in this situation... The people of the town are the field, ripe for harvest, and himself and the disciples are the reapers. And so then what's with these proverbs that Jesus quotes? Well, I think he's making the point that whilst normally there is a time of waiting between when someone sows and as the seed beds in, as it's watered and grows, and then when they reap the final product... In this case, there's no time lag at all. The sowers have done their work and already it's time to reap the harvest. And he says to his disciples, you've not done the hard work, but you're going to get the reward all the same. Now, I don't know how you feel when a new opportunity opens up before you, but for me, it mainly brings excitement. You know, when we start ideas like Chase the Light or Stir Up Sunday Online, I see potential and not problems most of the time. My brain runs with all sorts of scenarios of how we can make these things work, sometimes good, some of us not. And in our church's case, it also excites me with the potential we have for for blessing our local community, making good the soil of our field and starting to sow the seeds of the gospel. For in the face of gospel work, we have a God, friends, who can do immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us. And that means, inspired by his spirit, 
we should be stepping out and doing courageous things for him that draw us to our knees in prayer and reliance upon him. For if we can do it ourselves, what need is there for God to show up in power? For our witness is never more powerful than when we can say it was him who did this work and not us. Do you see the potential or problems before you when you consider sharing the gospel? For when we reflect on the persecuted church and their willingness to share the word, despite the enormous risk to their lives, how does that reframe our view of what is scary and challenge that fearful attitude that... (laughs) Today is not really the right time or place to witness to Christ. Perhaps even the writer of Ecclesiastes may be able to help us with this one. When he says, He who watches the wind will fail to sow, and he who observes the clouds will fail to reap. As you do not know the path of the wind, or how the bones are formed in a mother's womb, so you cannot understand the work of God the maker of all things. Sow your seeds in the morning, and do not rest your hands in the evening, for you do not know which will succeed, whether this or that, or if both will equally prosper. Now that's all well and good, but I do think that the hardest thing about gospel work, when we've stepped out in faith, is that we don't always see the fruit of our labour. We can spend time praying for people and, and never seemingly see any change. We can spend time sharing God's love in word and action and feel like no progress has ever been made. But friends, we must not be discouraged, for God's timing is not like ours. We must continue to be obedient, helping people to see that God is good and that Christians are okay. We must continue stepping out in faith, bravely offering opportunities for people to come and see Jesus. Finding common ground with friends and family to allow natural conversation to arise about our faith and letting our trust in the Lord Jesus shine through in contrast to their position. All this we see in the conversation between Jesus and the woman at the well. And we must be willing to step out and challenge when most of the stumbling blocks have been wrestled with. When the spirit prompts us the time is right. We must be willing to speak boldly and trust God that he will do the rest. And here's the hard bit. We might not be the people God will use to do all of that for our friends and family. Now, I'm not saying we should ignore them, but I am saying that we need to be willing to allow God to also use us to be the answer to the prayers of other people, wherever he takes you, in whatever you do at other times. Does the idea of seeing God's message of salvation change lives excite you and energise you? Are you open to seeing where there may be a harvest beyond your prayers? In people you don't suspect the gospel will take root in. And here's another challenge. The one of pride. The one of pride in wanting to be the reaper. Wanting to be seen as the one who has brought forth another person into the kingdom. Adrian Plass in one of his books does a, does a great sketch about this. But there are, there, are, there are two points here. Because first, we need to hold on to humility. And we can do that by keeping the words of John 3 verse 30 emblazoned on our hearts. He must increase and I must decrease. The woman in our story brings people to Jesus as they've believed because of her testimony. Gosh, she must have felt good. But do you know what? We're never told her name. And then once they meet and hear Jesus for themselves, 
she is left behind. As the reality of their relationship with him is deepened, as Jesus shows them the Father, and as they grasp an even greater vision than that of the Jews, that Jesus is the saviour of the world. Friends, pride has no place in saving souls. And secondly, our priority should always be to maintain unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There should be no division in God's kingdom, for both the sowers and reapers should rejoice together as we seek to make Jesus known. We are all partners on this journey, not competitors. And I recognise this is not an easy thing to live out. But whilst within the body of Christ, there are clearly different roles we are all called to do. The job of sowing and reaping is common ground. For we are all called to go and make disciples of all nations, baptising them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey all that Jesus has commanded us. Friends, this rejected woman becomes the first evangelist to the Samaritan people. (laughs) Wow, she didn't see that coming when she went to collect her water. And the disciples never saw that coming either on their journey. But by Jesus being obedient to the will and mission of God to reach all people, seeing potential and not problems, taking risk and not playing safe, and working in partnership in new ways, we witness the harvest never imagined before. Now, whilst we're in lockdown, I know it can be hard to see beyond our four walls. But what if we're to reframe our thinking to see this as a season of winter? Perhaps then we can see this time as filled with potential to go slower, seeing anything we do as preparation work in our fields, taking time to observe, reassess and plan, and most importantly, making space to hear what God is teaching us about himself, his church, and where his fields for mission will lead us to work both individually and collectively in the future. Now, I've scattered a few questions throughout my sermon today, and so I'm not going to reiterate them now. I'll post them on the the website for those who would find that helpful. But I do want to say this. Whatever you do with those questions, this week can I encourage you to make intentional time to rest in the presence of God and invite his spirit to help you see the fields that are ripe for you to be involved in harvesting. Lord, take my words and may the ones that are true for each person fall on fertile ground. May your word bed into each one of our hearts as it needs to. And may we have the confidence to trust your spirit's prompting and to step out in faith in response to what you're saying to us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Before the throne of God
When Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within, I put a look and see him there, who made an end to Around the world, our brothers and sisters don't have the freedom we have to openly share communion, to openly sing like we have just done of our Father God. And yet, together, we do declare before the throne of God above, we have a perfect High Priest whose name is Love, who has revealed himself to us as Jesus Christ. And so, in a similar way, to, to being not able to worship like that uh, it's also the fact that many of them don't have access to uh, bread and wine in the same way that we do for example in north korea uh, they use biscuit or fruit and juice in vietnam christian prisoners use food and honey to represent bread and wine and so today on this uh, day of prayer for the persecuted church, uh, Joy and I uh, are going to be using uh, just an ordinary cracker and some grapes uh, to show the solidarity of our church family with the persecuted church. And in a moment, uh, the words of the institution will come up on the screen because we won't be reading them out loud as many this day will be sharing in hidden places, not speaking rather just passing that one copy of the Bible they have uh, between themselves to help celebrate this meal. Now, of course, uh, we know that there's some people who are uh, tuned in with us who, who can't see, and so I will say a couple of words at the point when we will be eating and drinking together, and you are welcome to use whatever elements that you want to do uh, to join in this uh, communion time together. But let's use the time where there is silence which will feel uncomfortable and will feel unusual let's use that to allow the meaning of this meal to seep deep into our hearts as the only words that are spoken are those of scripture as we join with the majority of the global church who will be silent while celebrating this meal 
at the end of that time, Joy will lead us in some prayers for our church community in the world. So we celebrate our service with the persecuted church. We share the bread. We share the wine. Lord God, thank you for today. Thank you that in this country we are free to meet together openly to worship you and to share in communion. Again, we pray especially for our brothers and sisters around the world who are not able to do these things for fear of persecution and even death. Lord, thank you for their faith and trust in you. We pray so much for safety and for perseverance for every Christian around the world and for others to come to know you even in such dangerous circumstances. We pray for all who are working to spread your good news around the world and particularly for the work of BMS World Mission. We bring the country of North Korea before you and ask that you will bring change and freedom there. We pray that King Jong Un and his family would come to know you. Lord, we continue to pray for our world in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic for safety and protection for the vulnerable and for medical and essential workers, for healing for those with the virus, for comfort for those who have lost loved ones or lost their livelihoods. We also pray for those whose mental health has been affected by being in lockdown, that they would have the support that they need in this difficult time. We thank you God for the news that vaccines are being developed and we pray for all those who are involved in this. But most of all, Lord, we pray for you to bring an end to this virus. Lord, we bring before you all within our church family who are particularly in need at this time. For those whose work or personal situation has been affected by COVID-19. For those who are struggling with their mental and physical health for those who are feeling lonely and isolated. 
Lord, we pray especially at this time for Nick, for Pat, for Pam and for Joan and for their families. May they know the peace and comfort that only you can bring and may they be reminded of how much you love them. We pray too for Frances as she moves away from Warwick that she would quickly settle into her new home. Lord, we pray for your blessing on the plans for Stir Up Sunday. Thank you for this opportunity to engage with our local community and to share your love with others around us. Help us to have the courage to invite those we know to take part in this event and we pray that they would want to know more about you as a result. We thank you, Lord, for the work of food banks, both in Warwick and around the country, we pray that they would continue to be able to provide food and other essentials for anyone who needs it, especially during this pandemic. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you for joining us today for our service. If you've been visiting or you've just not made yourself uh, known uh, recently to us, then please do uh, drop us a message. Similarly, if you're a regular watcher uh, and worshipper with us, uh, then please do use the website to uh, drop some comments and encouragement to all those who have been involved today. And similarly, if you want to get involved, if there's some way that you can help serve in these services, then please do get in touch with myself or Martin as we'd love to have more people uh, serving our community. Finally, a reminder that later on on Sunday, uh, the 15th at 4pm, we have our special church meeting and we hope as many members as possible can be there. Uh, if you can't, just drop an email to Martin uh, so that he's aware of your apologies. For now, let's close our service by saying the grace together. We say, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all forevermore. Amen.